Hi, this is uh, Paul Baker from Kingston Library, uh, bringing you the first in uh, a couple of reviews, which are going to be uh, tackling volumes one and two of the new trilogy by Philip Pullman, which is the, uh, the follow-up to his Dark Materials, which uh, many of us kind of read and loved. Some of us read it when we were kids, some when we were, when we were adults. Absolutely fantastic series. And today we're going to be looking at the first of the trilogy, which is set uh, still in the world of uh, Lyra and Oxford with that um, fantastic mixture of uh, theology, philosophy, uh, mystical fantasy, and not least those sort of cool talking sort of spirit demons, which um, every human possesses, which is... Um, a physical manifestation of the soul, essentially. Uh, it's set 10 years before uh, the events of his Dark Materials. Um, Philip Pullman is keen not to describe it as a prequel. He'd rather call it uh, an equal. Uh, either way, it's set 10 years before. Um, and it reacquaints us with uh, many of the characters from these books. We get cameos from Lord Asriel and also Mrs Coulter, the inscrutable Mrs Coulter with her sinister uh, monkey demon. Uh, we meet a younger version of the, uh, the Egyptian father, Karam, uh, whom you'll remember from the um, original uh, trilogy. And we also get to meet Lyra, although as this is set 10 years before, rather than reading Ali Theometers and saving the multiverse as we know it, her main role is to gurgle and be cute because she's um, a baby. The hero of this story, rather, <clears throat> is uh, Malcolm, who's a boy who is about 10 or 11, um, helps out uh, at his parents' uh, water park, waterfront pub, uh, The Trout, which again is located in this sort of steampunk version of Oxford uh, that you'll particularly remember from um, being explored in the Northern Lights. And uh, Malcolm's pride and joy is his canoe, uh, called La Belle Sauvage, hence the title of the book. Now the plot really gets going uh, when Malcolm witnesses a stranger dropping a secret message before being apprehended uh, by a pair of thugs, at which point poor innocent Malcolm gets drawn into this world of politico-religious uh, uh, subterfuge. On one side we've got the theocratic fascists of the Magisterium, who, again, you will remember from the original trilogy, and they're very much um, present in this new one. Um, not least their kind of sinister Stasi, the agents of the uh, the CCD, or the Constitutorial Courts of Discipline. And there's a lot about the surveillance state here, which sends its roots very deep. Uh, for instance, Malcolm School is rather taken over by their youth movement, sort of echoes of the Hitler Youth going on here, uh, called the League of St. Alexander, uh, whose members are invited to inform on parents and their their friends, and it results with the teachers at the school being terrified of their own pupils. So all sorts of uh, horrible echoes from uh, 20th century and indeed 21st century history going on here. Uh, and on the other side, the other sort of organisation is this shadowy resistance movement known as Oakley Street. And the book kind of comes in two big sections. Uh, the first part is more or less kind of building the world, setting the scene. There's um, various kind of incidents which happen in the, the pub, which is run by Malcolm's parents. Uh, various goodies and baddies going through there. Plenty of roast beef and apple pie. So it's quite boys only in some way, or at least this section is, and we'll also come back to the tone in a minute. Uh, Malcolm also gets acquainted with Oakley Street, who are this, you know, who are trying to fight back against the suppression of free will and free speech uh, imposed by uh, the Magisterium. And he gets in some close scrapes with a, a guy called Gerard Bonneville, who is this ex-con who has a, a hyena demon and who is hell-bent on kidnapping the infant Lyra, who at this point has been given by her father, Lord Asriel, uh, to uh, the local nunnery to be uh, protected and sheltered by the nuns there. And what separates the two sections is this fantastic flood, which engulfs Oxford, engulfs the priory and the town, 
um, and Malcolm has to escape with the, the baby Lyra and also um, a slightly older girl called Alice, who's sort of a frenemy. They start out as, you know, bitter enemies. And by the end of the book, they formed a very close bond. Um, uh, and there's this kind of sort of phantasmagorical, uh, almost hallucinatory dreamlike journey across kind of flooded Oxford. And it's at this point um, that we sort of brush up against much older mythologies. There's echoes of Albion and old Father Thames, uh, sort of fairies, kind of, you know, gardens of forgetting. And we get much more of some of the elements that really came to the fore in the latter parts of the uh, the original trilogy. Um, so it's a fantastic book. It's uh, full of the, the, the adventure uh, and the thrills that you'll remember from the um, from his Dark Materials. Uh, equally, characters that you will just fall in love with uh, and really, really care about. It, again, has that really um, intelligent subtext. There's kind of, you know, layers upon layers going on in this book, if you kind of care to look for them. One thing to say about the tone is that uh, you'll find this book usually in in the teen section of a of a, a library or a bookshop and for good reason this is definitely darker in tone than the original trilogy which is usually found in the kind of children's section although personally i think it's for older children because even the original stories have some very dark elements in them uh, but this one really kind of ramps that up uh, not least in the in the figure of gerard bonneville who is this terrifying sort of psychopathic predator who's hell-bent on kidnapping the baby Lyra um, and just does some really kind of terrible things. And it's for that reason that I would suggest that if, you got, if you're a parent who has kids who have read the original trilogy and want to read this one, you might want to read it yourself first. I say it's not for younger children. Um, I think it's for teens and up. But... Uh, Read it yourself first and you can make a value judgment. Um, that said, uh, it is a, a brilliant um, return to the uh, the world of his dark materials. It has all the elements you'll remember, but um, it really kind of builds on that. Um, and this prologue, as well as being a fantastic standalone tale, it really sets a scene what's going to come next in the uh, the series i should have said the name of the series is the book of dust so this is the book of dust trilogy um and the second volume of that um which is the secret commonwealth or we'll, we are going to look at in the uh, next review one final thing to say if you are downloading the audiobook version of this um a massive shout out to the narrator which is the actor michael sheen uh, Michael Sheen of, of Good Omens and various Hollywood blockbusters. And I think an audiobook lives or dies on the narrator. It could, be, it could be an amazing story, but it can be ruined by a bad narration. Michael Sheen is superb. He's got this bottomless pit of voices and accents, and he really brings the story to life, brings the emotion of it to life. And um, you will just felt carried, carried along by the way he narrates the story. So it's a brilliant book. It's a brilliant equal or prequel. Um, and we will follow this up with the next review, which will be on uh, The Secret Commonwealth.